In this video, I want to talk about interactivity, or what's sometimes called ergodic storytelling. In particular, I'm going to talk about what ergodic storytelling is and define um, some of the different ideas and concepts around interactivity that can help you as a storyteller. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges when users can choose their own path through a story, and I'm going to talk about some tools and tips. So first of all, what are we talking about when we talk about interactivity? It might seem straightforward, but actually there are a number of different definitions and quite a bit of research exploring this idea of interactivity, which is quite useful for us as storytellers to help us think about this idea in different ways. Lou and Schrum, for example, identify a number of different aspects of interactivity, uh, including the degree to which uh, communication parties can act on each other, so in other words, the different people involved and how they can affect each other, uh, the method of communication and how they can control those, the messages themselves and whether those can be changed, and the degree to which there's some sort of synchronisation. By synchronisation, what we mean is whether people have to be in the same time or place or not. So, for example, um, a telephone conversation is interactive in that you can act on each other, you can uh, listen to the other person and react to that, but you both have to be there at the same time, so it has to be synchronised. Email, by contrast, is asynchronous. In other words, you are not synchronised. You might send a message at one time and someone else reads it at another time. So that's a different dimension of interactivity, just to give one example. Being able to have control over the communication method might be that you have a choice whether to experience a story through audio or video, for example. Being able to have control over the messages themselves, um, there might be some form of interactivity where you enter your name and that changes the content that's being presented to you. So, so at a very simple level, it might just address you by your first name. Just to illustrate the control over the, um, the, the people involved, so looking back here, the degree to which communication parties can act on each other, uh, this is a diagram from my book, The Online Journalism Handbook, which illustrates that particular dimension of interactivity. And one of the common blind spots when it comes to telling stories with interactivity, often when we talk about interactivity, we think about, for example, how the user or the audience can communicate back to us. So there might be the facility for them to add a comment or to um, click on something and that changes what they experience. But it's easy to overlook that there can also be interactivity between the audience themselves or between readers or users, not just between us and them. And that's an important dimension to consider in interactivity. How are we facilitating that um, user to user communication? It might be something like creating a, a hashtag or a forum where they can communicate with each other. Extending that idea of control further, you might also consider different dimensions of control, such as whether users can control input, so they can input in some way into the story, whether they control the output, so what form the story takes, whether they have control over space, so uh, for example, something being mobile or something being fixed, they have to experience it on a desktop, for example and whether they have control over time. Um, live content uh, involves the user having to be there at the time, so are they able to access it at a different time? Can they store it? Can it be archived? And so on. So again, these should give you different dimensions around which to think about interactivity in your storytelling. Looking at another set of uh, ideas around interactivity, Downs and Macmillan identify six different dimensions of interactivity and uh, the fourth of those is specifically around control, which is what Liu and Shrum focused on and which we've talked about in the last few slides, but they actually identify some other dimensions as well. For example, the direction of communication, is it going in one way or two ways or multiple directions? We've mentioned about time flexibility already. Sense of place is quite an interesting dimension. So is this something that immerses you in an experience or do you not have that sense so much? How responsive is the piece of storytelling? And 
to what extent, you know, what is the purpose of the communication? That's one important dimension to think of, which we'll come on to. Now, Lev Manovich has um, written quite widely and in depth and, and very early on about how um, interactivity has, if you like, come about and become popularised and, and more widely adopted. And he makes a really interesting argument about the role of the database in this process. Essentially, what he argues is that in the 20th century and before then, the idea of narrative um, has been replaced by this idea of the database. And in particular, he makes the point that what the database has made possible is this separation of content and interface. So in other words, uh, previously, before the digital age, before the database age, the content and the interface were the same thing. The painting was one thing. It wasn't um, information about the painting and then the actual canvas itself. But with digital media, it's possible to separate those two things. You might have words that make up an article, but they can, those words can be presented in different ways. At a very basic level, for example, if you access a website on a mobile phone, you're often going to be served a different version of that story to if you access it on desktop. This is called responsive design. So um, there are lots of examples where databases are used and where interfaces change in the way that you interact with them. Anything that involves personalization or where the user has to make certain choices about how a, a story plays out. Even simple things like social media accounts. When you go to Twitter, essentially you're accessing a database and a stream of updates are presented to you, which is specific to you and based on a number of editorial decisions that's separate to the content of what actual information could be presented to you. Jensen talking specifically about uh, interactivity in terms of uh, on-screen kind of clickable uh, elements and hovers uh, identifies four different types of activity again so these are also worth thinking about if you're creating or considering creating an interactive story. Uh, one type is transmissional interactivity. This is where you hover over elements and get extra information about them. So, for example, I might hover over uh, images of characters in a TV show and get a little bit of extra information about each of those. Then there's consultational interactivity. This is the idea of being able to access different views of the same information, the same data. So, for example, we might have data on uh, the amount of time that people are on screen in Star Wars films. And we can look at that as a bar chart, or we can look at that as a pie chart, or we can look at that as a series of profile pictures of the characters sized in different ways. Equally, we might, we might move around a physical space and uh, use consultational interactivity in that way. So you might use a mouse to click and drag to change our perspective of a room or a space. Then there's conversational interactivity. This is where the user has some sort of input and this is displayed in response. I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, you draw it where the, the user can draw on the screen and this obviously is displayed back to them. And finally, the fourth type is registrational interactivity. This is essentially personalization where the user inputs something and this influences the display. So they might uh, type in where they live and information local to them is displayed or they type in their name and there's a, a personalized experience for that. So here are some examples of those types of interactivity. This is transmissional interactivity. You can see some rollovers in the top left corner. Um, some information windows on maps are quite a common example of this as well. This is conversational interactivity. Um, the New York Times have created a, a series of um, stories called You Draw It, where instead of presenting you with a finished chart, they present you with half a chart and invite you to draw the line before the actual line is revealed. It's quite an interesting way of getting the user to engage and, and to some extent question their own assumptions about what they think the uh, facts are. And this is an example of registrational interactivity, a story about global heating 
and the user is invited to put in their hometown and the year that they were born and then a different story is told based on information relevant to that user. Now what's interesting about Jensen's research is that he has found different types of um, effect with different types of interactivity. So if your objective is to uh, is for users to enjoy the story or to have favourable attitudes, then transmissional and consultational forms appear to be quite good at that. But they don't necessarily increase knowledge acquisition, so people don't necessarily um, learn or remember uh, the information involved. Conversational interactivity has been found to increase loyalty. So again, this kind of shows you that it's not just about being interactive, but actually why you might want to be interactive and how that guides your choices. So just to sum up some of these points, first of all, remember interactivity is not something that's simply on or off. You don't simply make something interactive or not interactive. Actually, you can make it interactive in many, many different ways. So when you start to plan your production, your storytelling, it's worth considering what types of interactivity, if you want interactivity, you're going to have in your storytelling. It's really important to plan that before you start production because often you will need to gather certain information to achieve certain types of interactivity. In some cases, the interactivity might be part of the production if you want to involve users in that rather than it being something that's just kind of added on at the end. Secondly, um, the separation of content from interface is really what's driving this exploration and, and a really creative period of, of storytelling around interactivity. So think about how your content is separated from the interface. Do you need to store information in some sort of database to facilitate interactivity? Do you need to structure information so that people can get personalised experiences, for example? And finally, use the literature that we've touched on and further research to give you ideas to inspire you and help you think differently about the possibilities available to you. In terms of practical steps with these ideas, you can, as I said, use the definitions to come up with ideas for different types of interactivity. So it's quite useful to, to have a list, one of the lists that we've explored, and then come up with different ideas for each element in that list. This can free up your imagination and give you more creativity. Secondly, consider what your objectives actually are. Why are you using interactivity? And the first question is whether you should. And then use the research to find out which forms of interactivity might be most appropriate. Finally, you can critically analyse examples of interactive storytelling and use some of these concepts to identify the different methods that they use and indeed the types of interactivity that they decide not to use. Based on that, you can get ideas to inspire your own work, not just best practice, but also bad practice that you might want to avoid. In terms of further reading and listening, you should be reading um, Database as a Symbolic Form by Lev Manovich, a, a seminal piece of work which goes into more detail on some of these ideas. Um, and the podcast series Story Things talks about interactive storytelling as well. For some extra reading, you can read the chapter on interactivity and code from the Online Journalism Handbook. And the bottom two links there have all my bookmarks about uh, interactivity as a concept, including research and industry literature. And um, anything tagged interactive is basically an interactive piece of storytelling. So if you want to look at examples, that's the bottom link on the screen.